Hey there, everybody. Welcome hey. into the hey. ESPN FC studios. Sebastian Salazar, Ale Moreno, Shaka Hislop, and Nadam Anuo. What a crew we have assembled to take your questions from social media. You forgot Nadam? Wow. Nadam. I forgot the hey there, everybody. Hey. 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 And, and by the way, you didn't forget Nadam, but you mispronounced his, his last name, though. I oh, did? Did he? Yeah. Did he? he went, I'm, I'm just saying. It's, Nadam, help me out here. No, you, you went Onuo. No, it's no. Onuo. It's Onua. Onua. It's, I need you to say it with, say it with confidence, sir. Yes. You know Onua. how to do it. Onua. It just rolls right off the tongue. Nadam Onua. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I yeah, said it so much yeah, that yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's right well, Were you guys roommates yeah. in the World Cup? We were roommates. And then you know what? What? And then Nadam got called home early. Uh -huh. And Shaka came in. Wow. Uh -huh. what, a, what a change. What a different <laughs> dynamic that was. It was just <laughs> Uh, it was like rooming with my cousin, and then I was rooming with my uncle, you know? <laughs> you're, being, you're being kind. You are being yeah. kind. My father's a uh, much younger brother. Yeah. Younger, yeah. Cousin. <laughs> younger cousin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How old did you say you were, Shaq? I've been 40. Can I actually tell you what? I really enjoyed Qatar for many reasons, but uh, my time with those two was right up there. We had some great heart-to-hearts in the apartment, on the balcony there. You don't, even, you don't even remember, do you? <laughs> okay. Nadam. I know Nadam. <laughs> it seems like you were doing all the talking and they were just sitting there. <laughs> it wasn't a heart to heart, it was just a heart. <laughs> <laughs> Nadam's no, laughing. Heart is up. It's true. It's true. It's true. All right, Tom, it's first true. question. It's true. It's true. Will that first half cause Posh to rethink accepting the U.S. job? Yeah. Uh, wouldn't blame him. Boy, it was pretty bad, huh? I don't know. I didn't watch it. Yeah, you did. We were literally watching it together, Shaka. In the first half. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You came uh, in a little right, bit later. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Honestly, it's the best policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, we, I, I was surprised to see that Mauricio Pochettino's name was still on that list of favorite managers yeah. yes. to take over the England national team. The odds makers will take I your money any that. which way, you know. Yeah. After I totally rubbish Lee Carsley, by the way, I see that list and I'm going, hold on a bit. Right. He's got every chance. Do yeah. you know more than the odds makers? What an what yeah. underwhelming list that was. Yeah, but, but to answer this question, if indeed, if we're going to believe the odds makers, is if Pochettino's in the running <laughs> and that job is offered to Pochettino, let me, let me just tell you, mm -hmm. he's not coming to the United States. Yeah. I mean, it's just simple as that. I'm not sure that that's actually what's Maybe happening Maybe that's why here. Casey doesn't want to talk about it. Oh. Casey knows sure. something that we don't. Hey, sure, he's... Hey, Casey told us he had paid his mortgage and everything. Yep. Oh, baby. Watched the U.S. game, watched the England game today, and said, you know what? Yeah, <laughs> I'll wait. I'm all good here. Yeah, look at this list. Guardiola's not going to take it. Right. Right. Pochettino, well, we see. Jürgen Klopp, I don't think he's going to take it either. Definitely not. Where... Lampard? Is Frank Lampard just making up the numbers here? Oh, that, right? no. That's what I'm, that's, you know, if that's where your list basically, is. Basically, what you're saying is it's between Carsey and Howe, basically, um, on this list. And Lampard, apparently. Wow. I'm just saying. I'm, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm I, yeah. Again, anyway. I go back to the question. If you're a U.S. fan and you look at this list and you kind of go, uh-oh. Yeah. Pochettino is as good a candidate as there is there, realistically speaking. I apologize to Lee Cosley. Well, no, too you late now, Shaq. Chance. No, no, no. Never no, too late to no, apologize. No, no, no. Well, yes, but too late for the conversation, Shaq. You know, but, but <laughs> I'm still apologizing. <laughs> I'm still apologizing. Speaking of Poch, realistically speaking, how far can he go with this pool of players? I love this. Realistically speaking. What do you think? <laughs> well, realistically speaking, whoever, you, you pick a manager in the world. Any, any manager. You, you can play manager bingo. Mm -hmm. And you pick the best manager that you think would be best suited to take over the United States men's national team. And if we're talking about how far can it take them in a World Cup? Home World Cup, home World Cup. Home, okay. Uh, round of 16, maybe quarterfinals, game set, and match. Okay. I, I want to ask you that question, Seb. How far do the U.S. need to go for you not to go home angry? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. That's, wow. <laughs> Miracle worker. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, I'm, I'm right on board with Ale. I think if you bring in a guy like Pochettino, you're doing it to do something extra, go a little bit further. I think asking for any more than a quarterfinal, even in a home World Cup, would be would be too much, even for the wildest of fans. So I think a quarterfinal would be the high end of the expectation. Round of 16 would be the low end of the expectation. And remember, in this World Cup, we'll have probably around... So if the U.S. got knocked out in a round of 16 in a home World Cup, 
You're all right. You're in the middle of the road. I guess that's that's kind of where that would be the round where it comes down to against two and how did they go out, right? Round of 32 doesn't matter. It's it's a total right. failure. Round of quarterfinals doesn't matter what happens. A total success. Round of 16, you get into the well, what happened? How did it go? You know, was it a good match? A bad match? I'll hold you to that, by the way. And now, to your point about being a 48-team World Cup, that means that the United States would have been playing for a while before they get to the quarterfinals. So you know how things are in this country. Oh, yeah. People get all excited. Yeah. People that don't know anything about soccer that all of a sudden become fans of the game and they're watching them. Here we go, USA, USA, USA. They lose to the quarterfinals and then lose total interest. Yes. Yeah. That's it's the reality of what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This country, though, is so like multinational though that I don't think you'll feel that in like terms oh no of, oh no like, I'm not talking yeah. about the other games I'm talking about the yeah. United States specifically totally yep that's that's how it is in most <laughs> tournaments which team will benefit most from this international break needing this time to reset from a slow start to the season also which team will regret the international break arresting the momentum they had with their hot start to the season N Natum seems like he has a very thoughtful answer ready for you Natum what do you got Mm, what do I have? Well, there are obviously some teams where all their players are away and they won't arrive back until probably Wednesday, this coming week. So for them, it's not really great preparation, but then for the other teams who are maybe middle of the road in the Premier League, which is obviously still a good standard, you've had the chance to work on things. You know, not least of all, for example, and I mean this in a respectful way, Everton probably needed a two-week break between games based on what happened in their last game against Bournemouth, conceding two goals and added time. But then Liverpool, maybe they didn't. But the fact is, those players, they left in good spirits and they're likely going to arrive back in good spirits and be ready to push on again. So I think more often than not, it's the teams where they actually have enough players around that can actually work on things who will benefit the most as opposed to the teams who just hope people come back in good health. What about Manchester United? Do you think they were happy for the break or sad for it? Oh, I... Um, you hate to go in off of a defeat like that. But it might be nice uh, to get away. Probably, yeah. I, I think I think more the players are more happy for the break than, than they are disappointed. Just to get away, just to get away from some of the noise, um, and, and 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 focus on on, mm -hmm. on other things. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you know who's miserable? The guys that actually have they didn't go on an international break, that didn't go and play with their national teams, and they have to show up for training, and they're taking the brunt of whatever the frustrations are from the guys who left. Those are the guys that play. I didn't play. I have to show up for training, and now I'm sort of paying the price for whatever they didn't do. Uh, I'm going to say a team that may regret the international break, Barcelona. Yeah. They are, they were flying. And, and I mean flying, and I'm playing at a high level. And more importantly, not only were they flying, Real Madrid were struggling, and they were trying to sort of find in themselves. And so, I don't know that Real Madrid all of a sudden find themselves magically because now they've had injuries in the international break. But if you are Hansi Flick in Barcelona, the last thing that you wanted to do was stop this momentum. And the last thing that you want to happen is any of these players coming back with injuries because that would break the momentum what had been a really, really good start. So you guys talked about this on the show yesterday, Ben White with England. A uh, question comes in here. Is White not wanting to be at international stage really such a big issue? He has gone in the past, hasn't had best of experiences. Yes, the staff has changed, but maybe he didn't want to reverse his call immediately. That's surely his call. Nadam, uh, where do you come down on this? So for me personally, I think he's free to do as he pleases, but just from a, a footballing standpoint, a lot of people will always perceive you to be somebody that's not ambitious because of it. Because I think for many, the perception is like the highest form of football you can play is international football. And when you do get a chance to play for England, there is theoretically the pressure and the belief that you can go and say, win a European Championship, potentially contest, you know, for a World Cup. And that is what most players aspire to do. When you hear them talk, you know, they can be attached to a club, but their identity for the national team, apart from obviously Rice and Grealish, stays the same. You know, these guys, they want to play. So when you hear somebody that's not interested in it, that's obviously good enough to be there, almost feels like they've shunned that team and kind of shunned their nation. And they haven't, because people are motivated by many different things and not everybody's in a position as, you know, Ali and Shaka will tell you, like where they don't want to go away for two weeks because they're not comfortable with that. And then tournament time, they want to be, they want to be away for four or five, six weeks, especially for some, because 11 players play all the time, but there's a group of people who don't play at all. 
So I get it, and I think he's free to do that. And I like the fact that he's been able to stand up for himself and say he's not interested. But unfortunately, from the moment he said that, he's always going to be perceived as being somebody who's unpatriotic. But realistically, you know, this is football, and he still remains an Englishman regardless. I can tell you, and, and, and I can only speak from my experiences. Early on in my career, I was getting called into the national team all the time and was playing exactly none of the time. Mm. And when I say none of the time, I was traveling the world sitting on the bench. Now, I watched brilliant games. Man, did I watch some games and did I watch some players, but I wasn't playing. And I, I must say that, yeah, some frustration sets in and, and, and you feel like there is nothing you can really do to maximize your place in the team because the, the coach who was in place obviously had a group of players that he trusted and I was sort of an outsider, but I would still be called in. And so as a young player, I saw, I, well, not, not sort of, I, I know for certain that I took that for granted and didn't quite recognize the importance of just being there and being part of the national team. And nothing really checks your ego, much more so than the moment in which the list comes out, you're expecting to be in the list, you take it for granted, and you're not in the list. And the next, next list comes out, and you're not in the list. And a year goes by, and you're not being called in, and you're kind of and you're. And in my case, I was scoring goals here, I was winning championships here, didn't matter. I wasn't being called in. Changing a manager, new coach calls me in. And man, I told myself, no matter what happens, no matter what my role is with the national team, I'm gonna make the most out of this opportunity because by then I had the maturity to understand that I'm representing more than myself, that this isn't just about my career and what my feelings are. You're representing a country. You're representing your family, your family name out in front of a nation. The hopes of a nation, you're representing that. And if my role was to be the best cheerleader on the bench, that's what I was gonna do. If my role was to draw some fouls, that's what I was gonna do. If it was score tappings, that's what I was gonna do. But that's a decision that I had to make once I was kicked in the backside. Once I had to check my ego and say, man, I really do miss being part of the national team, even if I'm not playing, because I wanna be among the best 22 players that represent my country. That's the part that I don't think Ben White has come to terms with and understands the importance of that, what that would mean for his career when he's done. Not right now, but when he's done. To, to, to that point, let, let me just say, I, I, I totally agree with Nathan. Ben, ben White is free to make whatever decision mm. he wants. I just don't know why it's a story. Mm. If, if he decides to I mean, a player saying no to the national team is a pretty big deal, isn't it? No, no. She's Dan saying no to the national team <laughs> is a big deal. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I don't, you know, you know to, to Ali's I mean, doesn't point, that make it a bigger story? That to, a, to, so, to Ali's point, if when, as a young player, yeah. if when you were on the bench, you say, listen, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> how, how, how many articles would be nope. written up in Venice? None. <laughs> no. I, I just, Ciao. he's Bye. totally free to make that, and that's it, that's, 100% his decision. I just don't know why it's a story. I, 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 I don't know why Ben White saying no to England is a story. I think uh, I'm being told we should move on because we've talked about this quite a bit the last few days. All right, okay. We'll, we'll leave it for another time. Natum, your top three, not best, your top three favorite city players of all time. Um, personal, collection. personal collection, Kevin De Bruyne. Um, I would say Sean Wright Phillips, uh, De Bruyne for obviously being De Bruyne, Sean Wright Phillips being somebody that helped me get into that first team and made my job pretty easy because all I had to do when he was on the wing, I just passed in the ball and he did everything else. <laughs> made me look really good. Thank you very much, Sean. And finally, um, I would say Sergio Aguero. Well, no, I'll, no, 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 I won't say Sergio Aguero. I'll say I'll say Carlos Tevez. Wow. Because Carlos Tevez coming from Manchester United to Manchester City was one of the most significant parts of the club's history. And Aguero's obviously gone on to score more goals, to have the statue and stuff. But Tevez arriving there meant something really significant, and that was the start of things beginning to change. And within a few years, they were on FA Cup, won a league, and here we are today. Okay. 
Yeah. Kevin De Bruyne, Sean Wright Phillips, and that was, good. Was, that was a good one. I, I, you like, so. Are you okay with this top three? I, I, absolutely. I, I, I loved every minute. Of it, it really doesn't help our Bundesliga coverage because Nadeem is brought in to talk <laughs> about Vincent Company. He doesn't mention Vincent Company, so yeah, well, well. come on now. Uh, listen, you can do that. He's, he's, a, he's an honorable mention in number four. Uh, Nadam's so interior decorator has provided our next question for Seb and Ale. Who's making MLS Cup? Well, I know who's winning MLS Cup. Ah, uh, there it is. <laughs> My beloved Columbus crew. And they, they, when, when I say that they look like the best team in the league, it's not just me saying it because it's a Columbus crew. Oh. It's, it, they, are, they seem to be playing at a different level and a different type of football than everybody else. Uh, they're dynamic, they're explosive, they score goals, uh, they defend well enough, they have, a, they have a lot of depth, which not a lot of MLS teams do, mm -hmm. and they have a manager in place that obviously has been able to, to create a culture and a style of play that the players are loving are loving and when you're a player and you love showing up every day for work that usually creates an environment in which you're gonna get results. Defending champions just won the uh, league's cup as well who would you have them facing in the final? LAFC probably okay. and uh, it would Galaxy be... Galaxy are hot right now. Yeah they are. I still have my questions about the LA Galaxy and whether this actually lasts mm -hmm. and uh, I, I like what Greg Vanny is doing. I like the turnaround of that team. Just think about the mess that the LA Galaxy were last season as to where they are now. And he's been able to navigate some really tricky, turbulent waters. Um, they're in a good place. But if push comes to shove, I think LAFC is slightly better than the Galaxy. Uh, if Messi comes back for Inter-Miami, does that change who you think gets out of the East? Or are you sticking with Columbus? <sighs> well, I, I think it would make for a very interesting match. What's going, what's, what's going on? RSL. RSL shout in there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, RSL, RSL okay. my friends. Okay. I thought, RSL. I thought, I thought Don't we were worry having, about LA. I thought we were having a serious conversation. Ah! Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were an, an, uh, giving analysis. Uh, you know? as well, there's more chance of that uh, phone making uh, yeah. making an MLS cup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Keep that energy. Keep that energy. Uh, we'll remember this. Yeah. We'll I, remember um. This. It's, it's really going to be interesting to see if indeed it pans out that way, the Columbus crew and Inter Miami, because it's not only a clash of styles, it's a clash of cultures, it's mm -hmm. a clash of how do you build yep. a franchise, how do you sell a franchise to your fans, how do you present yourself in the community, and it's a lot of substance to what the Columbus crew are doing, and we want to see that same substance from Inter Miami in the playoffs. And we're only going to get that substance if indeed Lionel Messi is healthy. And so it, it'll be fun. It'll be a lot of goals because both teams will attack. I like it. Uh, I'm going Inter Miami LAFC. Okay. Inter Miami LAFC. Just assuming Messi. Hey, I always took back. you for a Columbus hater. I know. Ah, oh, come on, come on. Hey, and I took you to Al Paso Grill and you're everything. Right, you're right. I was, I was fortunate enough to be in Columbus in the shadow of Juan Ale Moreno. Oh. Right let me tell you. <laughs> doors open. Let me. I mean. When, when you're in Columbus with Ali, Ale Moreno. doors open. Uh, it's probably like being in the Caribbean with you. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Well, more, everything opens. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, moving, move on, moving on. Or, or yeah. Manchester with that. Uh, moving uh, 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 Yep. Yeah, yeah. uh -huh. yep. All right, we'll leave it there for now before we get anybody yeah. into too much trouble here on Extra Time. Uh, for Nadam, Shak, and Ale, I'm Seb. Thanks for watching, and the boys will be back right here in this same studio tomorrow.